Hey, thanks for last week. Thanks for being flexible. Thanks for being open. Thanks for serving our Grace Five Cities, brothers and sisters, uh, enduring the message with, via video last week. I've heard only positive things. Uh, I know the image was a little bit dark, but by and large, the response has been overwhelmingly positive. People have gone out of their way to fill out next step cards and send us emails and say, boy, that was, that was great. It was neat to experience what they experienced, and it worked. It was super engaging. So thanks. Thanks for being flexible in this service, and uh, we appreciate that. It was so valuable for me to be down at Grace Five Cities for their first child dedication. Here's a pic picture for you. I don't know what's going on with Pastor Ben there. I think he's praying that I won't take Keller out of his arms, but, you know, praying ahead of time, just can't let go. But we had a great time last week. It was so sweet. I met so many new people who have found their way to Grace Central Coast through Grace Five Cities, that campus. And uh, I was able to meet many of them, reach out and say, I don't know you. And they say, we know you. And uh, I was able to chat with them. And I said, oh, I do know some things about you because Pastor Pastor Ben has been telling me about uh, couples that have been finding us down there, and it was uh, just such a sweet morning together, and the child dedication was fantastic. So thank you again. Speaking of child dedication, you know, we, we are in the middle of this baby boom here in our church, and uh, I've been trying to get out and see these families in the hospital. It's one of the things I do. Uh, I don't make it to all of them, but I try. And last month, I was uh, in uh, a hospital room holding a brand new baby, and a nurse walked in, and she said, oh, are you the proud grandpa? And I thought, how can I be a grandpa? I'm 24 years old. And then I went home and I looked in the mirror. And then I did the math. And I could have been a grandpa to that child just by sheer virtue of the math. I mean, the numbers worked. And I thought, how in the world did this happen? Where did those years go? I just about dropped the baby. I didn't. So, I'm still processing this a month later. Hey, we are continuing our Route 66 road trip across the Bible, where each week we're looking at one of the 66 books of the Bible. We worked our way through uh, the 39 books of the Old Testament, and now we're halfway through the New Testament, and today we come to kind of a new category, a new micro-category. Uh, Paul wrote all these letters. He wrote a number of letters to local churches, but then he wrote four letters to individuals, three of them to other pastors in ministry, two to Timothy and one to a guy named Titus. And so we're looking today, as we continue our series, at Paul's first letter to Timothy, the book of First Timothy. When I was so much, uh, when I was such a younger pastor, I discovered and fell in love with these pastoral letters, these pastoral letters. Epistles, First and Second Timothy in the book of Titus. And they really taught me early on the purpose and the priorities of the local church. And uh, I, I just, it was so helpful for me to see, for, to understand the kind of man that a pastor was supposed to be. These pastoral letters gave me tracks to run on and a target to aim for. And I learned as I studied the pastoral letters that uh, a pastor is not to stick his you know, finger in the wind to see which way the cultural winds are blowing. That's not how the church works. That's not how pastoral ministry works. In fact, God has told us the purpose of the local church and what are to be the priorities of the local church. Now that I am apparently a grandpa pastor, I got to tell you, nothing has changed for me. I still love Paul's pastoral letters, and I find them just as urgent, just as relevant, just as practical as ever for me, for the rest of our staff, younger uh, staff members that are coming on, but also us grandpa pastors as well. Uh, and not just for our staff, but for our church. First Timothy, the first of Paul's pastoral letters, reminds us what to look for in a local church, what's important in a local church, 
and what we strive for here in our church, Grace Central Coast. We could say a lot because a lot's said in the book, but today I want to uh, focus on three big things together. I want you to see these things in the text of 1 Timothy. I told you we visit our daughter's church down in LA. She's a college student down there. And uh, we visited her church a, a couple weeks back. And I was just reminded, I want her to know what to look for in a local church and what's important in a local church. I had the sweet opportunity this week to uh, uh, speak to our uh, high school students on Wednesday evening here in our Grace Slow campus. And uh, I want them to know, too, because many of them, they soon will be heading off to college, and I want them to know what's important in a local church, what to look for in a local church. I want them to get it, and I know that the time is short. If you've been worshiping with us just recently here at uh, Grace Central Coast, I want you to know that we're striving for these things here in our church. We want you to know what we're about. If you've been worshiping with us for five years or 15 years or 25 years or even 50 years, there are people worshiping in this church that have been worshiping in this room for 50 years and more. We too, we need to be reminded of what's important in a church and what we're together striving for here at Grace Central Coast. We can't assume these things. We can't take them for granted. We got to value them. We got to protect them. We got to nurture them. We got to pursue them together. And we've got to teach our kids to do the same. Because the minute we begin to assume these things, we begin to lose these things. So here's the first thing to look for in a local church. The first thing that Paul tells Timothy, the first thing that's important, the first thing we're striving for here at Grace Central Coast godly leadership. Not perfect leadership, but godly leadership. 1 Timothy is a letter from one seasoned, experienced pastor, church leader. Paul, to Timothy, a less experienced, still learning church leader. Timothy's, to, Timothy, Timothy's pastoring the church at Ephesus. He's figuring stuff out. And it's very clear that he has his, has his hands full. And he's probably in just a little bit over his head there in Ephesus. Paul writes to encourage him. Paul writes to instruct him. Paul, and he makes this purpose clear uh, in those verses we read together in our scripture reading, 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 14. It really is a purpose statement for the whole book. Take a look again, 1 Timothy 3, 14. I hope to come to you soon, but I'm writing these things to you so that, Timothy, if I delay, you may know how one ought to behave in the household of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and buttress of the truth. Paul makes it clear. This is his first purpose statement. Paul writes so that Timothy will know how to conduct himself, how to lead there, how to behave in the church, the household of God, the church of the living God. One of the big themes in this letter is godly leadership, Timothy's own godly leadership, but also the godly leadership of others in the local church. Paul makes it clear, crystal clear, the church, like every nation, like every community, like every organization, like every family, rises or falls on the quality of its leadership. As the leadership goes, so goes that family, that organization, that community, that nation. As the leadership goes, so goes the church. I've seen it again and again and again in nearly 25 years of pastoral leadership. I guess I am a grandpa pastor. And so Paul challenges Timothy to be and to become a godly leader and to find and raise up other godly leaders around him as well. And so a local church must have exemplary leaders of character. Godly leaders are first and foremost men and women of character, men and women of integrity, men and women who are examples. Others can follow them. Others want to follow them. Character counts in leadership. Character counts in presidents. Character counts in pastors and elders and in deacons. Look with me at some of the qualifications for elders in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1. Here they are called overseers. The saying is trustworthy. 
If anyone aspires to the office of overseer, he desires a noble task. Therefore, an overseer or an elder must be above reproach, the husband of one wife, sober-minded, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, not a drunkard, not violent, but gentle, not quarrelsome, not... Uh, not a lover of money, he must manage his own household well with all dignity, keeping his children submissive. For if someone does not know how to manage his own household, how will, we, how will he care for God's church? And he goes on from there, and there's even more. But I want you to jump down to verse 8 and to see some qualifications for deacons. Deacons, likewise, must be dignified, not double-tongued, not addicted to much wine, not greedy for dishonest gain. They must hold the mystery of the faith with a clear conscience and let them also be tested first and let them serve as deacons if they prove themselves blameless. Just a quick side note because you may be asking if you're new here to our church. Here at Grace Central Coast, we believe that the Bible teaches that the office of elder or overseer is restricted to just men while the office of deacon is open to both men and women. A thorough explanation of why this is so is beyond the scope of today's message, but I've taught on this before, and so if you have questions about this in our church, I'd love to walk you through it. If you filled out a Next Step card and put your email on it and say, hey, I'd like to know more about that, I will be happy to send you a link to another message where I go into this in great depth and detail. I'd love to tell you why we believe this. But today, what I want you to see is that these qualifications are all about character because character counts. In leadership, character counts in church leadership, character counts for elders and deacons and growth group shepherds and Sunday school teachers, any and all who lead in the church. And check out a few of the many exhortations to Timothy to be and to become a godly leader. If you're a parent or a grandparent or you lead others here at Grace or others at your workplace, or others in our community, if you aspire to leadership, and I hope that you do, I want you to hear these words as a challenge to you, a personal challenge to you. I'm challenged by them every time I read them, every time I hear them. Have nothing to do with irreverent, silly myths. Rather, train yourself, Paul says, for godliness. For while bodily Uh, training is of some value. Godliness is of value in every way as it holds promise for the present life and also for the life to come. 1 Timothy chapter 4 verses 7 and 8. 1 Timothy chapter 4 verse 12. Let no one despise you for your youth, but set the believers an example in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, in purity. Keep close watch on yourself and on the teaching. Persist in this. For by so doing, you will save both yourself and your hearers. Jumping over to chapter 6, pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, steadfastness, gentleness, fight the good fight of the faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called and about which you made the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. This is the kind of godly leader that the church at Ephesus needed. This is the kind of leadership that every local church needs. The kind of godly leadership our church needs. And we take these words very, very seriously here in our church. As we call pastors to serve on our staff, other ministry staff, as we select and examine elders, and as we serve in the church together, we take these biblical qualifications very, very seriously. It's all over the place in 1 Timothy, and we've we've already been assuming it, but let's make sure we state it because it's not happening in every local church. It should be. Every local church must have a plurality of leaders. The leadership of a local church is never to be a one-man show. But sadly, many local churches are one-man shows where the pastor holds absolute power. Everywhere the New Testament talks about leadership in the local church, it speaks in plural terms. The New Testament model of local church leadership is a plurality of godly leaders who lead together and are accountable to the Lord, accountable to one another, and accountable to the larger church family. And that's clearly the case here in 1 Timothy. While Timothy might be the lead pastor, 
He has given qualifications for elders and deacons because others are to be leading with him. And notice the plurality in a couple of other verses. 1 Timothy 4.14, 4, 4, do not neglect the gift you have, which was given you by prophecy when the, you see it there, council of elders, that's plurality, laid their hands on you. Let the elders, plural, who rule well be considered worthy of double honor, especially those who labor in preaching and teaching. Hopefully, you are aware, if you're not, you need to be. We take this, too, very, very seriously. Grace Central Coast is led by a plurality of godly leaders, both ministry staff and elders, both men and women. We make every decision that's made, we make that decision together. I don't make all the decisions around here. I don't get my way all the time, and we think that's a great thing. It's good. A plurality of leadership is a protection for you, and quite frankly, it's a protection for me too. I can say with a clear conscience, I didn't make that decision. That's not my decision. That's our decision. We made that decision together. I don't want to make all the decisions around here, and I don't. You need to know, I serve at the pleasure of the rest of the elders. And when it's time for me to leave Grace Central Coast and move on, My commitment is to leave as quickly and as quietly as I possibly can. That is my promise to you. That's my commitment to the elders, and I remind them of that commitment at least once a year. And when it's time for me to leave, I will leave as quickly and as quietly as I possibly can because it's not about me. It's about the gospel. It's about what God is doing in this fellowship of believers over the long haul. You need to know that. We believe plurality is the biblical model of leadership. That means every local church must also be intentional about the development of new leaders. The fact that qualifications for elders and deacons are laid out in detail in this book means that leadership in the local church is not to be static, not to be fixed, not to be held in trust by a privileged few in the church. No, The church leadership is to breathe. It's to be raising up new leaders. Timothy's to be looking for other qualified, godly leaders, raising them up, discipling them, mentoring, like Timothy was himself discipled and mentored by the Apostle Paul. And again, look at 1 Timothy 3.1. Paul writes this, which implies that leadership development is happening in a local church, that a church is welcoming new leaders. The saying is trustworthy. If anyone aspires to the office of overseer, he desires a noble task, which means there's got to be something to aspire to. There's got to be an open seat at the table. Uh, Those who aspire to church leadership, that's a noble thing. There should be a way for them to aspire. Grace Central Coast has been blessed with a bountiful supply of godly leaders, both men and women. But we're committed to raising up more. We believe the future of our church depends on this, continued leadership development. In fact, it's one of our recently identified top priorities. And so we're trying to be intentional about raising up next generation leaders here in our church. And we want you to be committed to that as well. So the first thing to look for in a local church, the first thing that's important in the local church, the first thing we're striving for here in our church is godly leadership. Here's the second, gospel-centered teaching. Look closer again at that purpose statement of the whole book. It's 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 14. Notice with me how Paul speaks of the church, the phrases he used. I hope to come to you soon, Timothy, but I'm writing these things to you so that if I delay, you may know how one ought to behave. Look at what he says about the church. In the household of God, which is the church of the living God, a pillar and buttress of the truth. What is the local church in Paul's mind? How does he think about the church? How does he see the church? He tells us the church for Paul is the household of God or the family of God. We're going to say more about that in a second. The the church is the church of the living God. It's the place where God dwells with his people. Uh, The local church is a pillar and a buttress of the truth. And it's that last phrase that I want you to think about with me for a few minutes this morning. The church is the pillar of is a pillar of the truth. What does a pillar do? Think about that word picture. A pillar holds something up 
or we might think about it, hold something forth. As a pillar, the local church is to hold God's word forth. Hold it forth for one another. Hold God's truth forth for our kids. Hold God's truth out for a watching world, a needy world who desperately needs the truth of God. But Paul also calls the church, the local church, a buttress of the truth. Now, I had to think about this. I had to look this up. What's a buttress? A buttress is a brace or a support beam. Buttresses were often, got to be careful how you say that. Buttresses uh, were often built on the backsides of walls to hold them upright in former days. Here's one example. So what is Paul saying when he calls the church a buttress of the truth? As a buttress, the church is to hold, hold God's Word firm, right? So we're to hold God's Word forth, out, up as a pillar, and as a buttress, the local church is to hold God's Word firm. We're to protect it, not let go of it, hold it steady. But why do I say gospel-centered teaching? There's a reason. Because of what comes immediately next in the text, in verse 16, take a look. Great indeed, we confess, is the mystery of godliness. Now, you're going you're to know exactly what he's talking about. It. What, what, what Paul does here is he takes a well-known creedal statement that was probably used. Maybe they used it in their calls to worship, they, and, he, and he just drops it right in here. He says, he was manifested in the flesh vindicated by the Spirit, seen by angels, proclaimed among the nations, believed on in the world, taken up in glory. What's that all about? Tell me. Tell me. That's about Jesus. It ought not to be confusing, right? That's about Jesus. You got your eyes on the text? 1 Timothy 3.16, right? This is about Jesus. This is about the gospel. The life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. Paul is saying, Okay, you're supposed to do this. You're supposed to be a pillar, holding God's word forth. You're to be a buttress, the local church is, holding God's word firm. What's God's word all about? Here's the center of it. Here's the heart, the core, the center of God's truth. It's the gospel of Jesus Christ. While the gospel is not the whole of God's truth, it's the center of God's truth. We should hold it all forth. We should hold it all firm. But we must, at the center of it all, hold the gospel firm because all of it revolves around the gospel and this is what we've been saying over and over again in our series right that uh, the bible from cover to cover is telling one story it's the story of god's grace climaxing or centering around the person and work of jesus at the outset of this letter paul makes the same point right at the beginning he says paul he says he says timothy you got to confront false teaching in the church Here's what he says, 1 Timothy chapter 1, As I urged you when I was going to Macedonia, remain at Ephesus so that you may charge certain persons not to teach any different doctrine, nor to devote themselves to myths and endless genealogies which which promote speculations, rather than, look at this phrase, the stewardship from God that is by faith. What is he talking about there? He's talking again about the gospel. How do we know? Because he says it explicitly a few verses later in verse 15. The saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the foremost. There's the heart again. There's the center. That's what this thing is all about. Timothy, you got people in your church that are focused on all sorts of strange doctrines, genealogies, speculations about the law. Paul says, bring them back to the heart. Bring them back to the gospel. Bring them back to the center. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Make that the center of all your church life. That the center of all your teaching. Make this thing gospel-centered. This is the heart and soul and center of local church teaching. We are committed here at Grace Central Coast to gospel-centered teaching in every message and across all our ministries at all our campuses. In every setting here, we want it to be centered on Jesus. We believe that is our calling. Our goal 
is not morality for the sake of morality. Our goal is not rules for the sake of rules. Our goal is not well-behaved kids. Our goal is gospel-formed, gospel-shaped, gospel-drenched, gospel-centered kids, youth, college students, adults, and families. Politics are so important. But here at Grace, we work hard to stay away from politics. Why? Because our calling is to preach the gospel and to help you develop a gospel worldview and to teach you how to live and apply the gospel across every single area of your life, including your political life. But we preach the gospel. That's what we do. What should you look for in a church? What's important in a church? What are we striving for in our church? Godly leadership, gospel-centered teaching, and family commitment and care. Don't think here about nuclear family. Think church family. Do you remember the first thing that Paul called the church in 1 Timothy 3, verse 15? Take a look one more time. I'm writing these things to you so that if I delay, you may know how one ought to behave in the household, that word really is family, in the family of God, which is the church of the living God. Paul tells Timothy, this is what the church is. This is the way you must think about it. The church is the family of God, a family who belongs to the living God, a family created by God through the gospel, the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. We, look around you today, we are brothers and sisters together, those who trust Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. We've been adopted by God's grace alone. We belong to one another, and we belong to the God who lives. This is who we are. And this local church and that local church at Ephesus and every local church in our community and in every community belongs to God. And God cares deeply about how we behave, how we live, how we conduct ourselves, how we live together in this thing called the local church. And one thing is clear. We are to be a local church. A local church is to be a family who loves like the living God. Paul says in chapter 1, verse 5, take a look. The aim of our charge is love that issues from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. Paul urges Timothy, be an example of love. Paul urges Timothy in chapter 6, verse 11, pursue love along with righteousness and godliness and other things, pursue love. You, yourself, together as a godly leader, pursue love, but also your church, your local church, pursue love together. The local church should drip with the love of God. We must love one another. We must keep learning to love one another. We must lean in together. That's the aim of our charge. That's the goal and end of all gospel teaching. Down at Grace Five Cities last week, they had a little lunch afterwards, and I found myself sitting uh, across the table, lunch table, from a gal I didn't know, I didn't recognize, and her name was Tonya, and we introduced ourselves to one another, and she told me her story. She said, I, uh, I've been looking for a church. I really needed a family that I could belong to. I, I know that I needed this, and the Lord has so clearly led me here to Grace Five Cities and to Grace Central Coast. And she said, I'm involved in a, in a growth group and I feel like I belong and I feel like I've been loved and welcomed and it's been so sweet. And I thought, oh, this is what Grace Five Cities is all about. This is what we're doing. Like she's getting it, she's experiencing it. I was like praising the Lord right there. And, and as I was, as I was just delighting in this, um, some other gals came up behind her, and they didn't know what we were talking about. They didn't even know we were talking. And they interrupted, and they said, hey, Tonya, how are you, and how was your week? And I thought, it's happening right here. Look at these gals loving on one another. Look at this family that's being created. And I was so encouraged, and it turns out that they're all in a growth group together, and the gals are having coffee in the middle of the week together, and it's just working. And I just, oh, it's just cloud nine. It just was for me. 
This is, I hope you're experiencing that too. I've had many people say, I've experienced that too. Not everybody does. That's what we want. Let's keep leaning in together. Let's keep looking around and welcoming people to the family. And it's so clear that this family of God, that's to love like the living God, is also called to be a family who lives like the living God for the salvation of others. How does God live? What does this mean? What's this phrase about? I grabbed this because this word godliness, in other words, living like God, becoming like God, that word godliness shows up no less than 10 times in this book. So godliness, godliness, godliness. It's a big topic in this book. Timothy is challenged to live a godly life, and he's challenged to help his church live godly lives. Chapter 2, verse 1 is one of the ten places where we see this challenge. Take a look with me. 1 Timothy 2, verse 1. First of all, then, I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings be made for all people, for kings and all who are in high positions, that we might lead a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. This is good. And it is pleasing in the sight of God our Savior who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. I want you to see the flow of thought in these verses. Paul says, pray, pray for those, pray for all men, pray for those in authority over you, for kings, be a praying people. But as you are a praying people, why? Pray that you may lead godly lives, peaceful lives. But even even then, he's not done. He says that you may lead godly lives because God desires all men to be saved and to come to, to a knowledge of the truth. In other words, your godly lives are meant to be a light and a witness to others. And so pray with this in mind. Live with this in mind. Live missionally. Lead, lead, Lead godly lives. Love one another, not just for yourselves, but for the world as well. Because God is not finished. God wants to use you and your community and your love and your godly lives to draw others into the family. God desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth, and he uses our community. So we are to be a family who lives like the living God. In other words, we're godly for the salvation of others because God's not done in this world yet. So what should you look for in a local church? We have a number of families I, I grieve every time it happens, but we have a number of families who are in transition. They, the Lord is taking them out of our community and putting them in other parts of the country. And uh, this happens so often. Sometimes it's college students, but sometimes it's families as well. And right now there seems to be a number of families that the Lord is sending out from us. And when they, they often will come to me and they say, you know, do you know a church in this particular area? Do you know a church over here? Because uh, we're going to miss grace so much. And sometimes I do, and sometimes i got to do a little research. Who knows? That may be you. You may, the Lord may take you out of here at some point. I hope and pray He doesn't, but He may. And so you got to know. you got to know what to look for. you got to know what's important in a local church. And you got to know, really understand what we're striving for here at Grace Central Coast. Did you get them this morning? Godly leadership, gospel-centered teaching, family commitment, and care. I want to leave you with this today. It's I believe it deeply, and I think that Paul believes it deeply. I wonder if you believe it deeply. Here it is. How you and I see the church will determine how we experience the church, how we live in the church. Let me say it again. How you and I see the church, how we think about the church, will determine how we live in the church. It will determine, it will shape our experience in the church. So, how do you think of the church? How do you see the church? Do you see Paul's high view of the local church? He's got such a high view of the local church. He sees it in such grand terms. How do you see it? Do you see the local church as a social club? We do everything but serve drinks here. Do you see the local church as a lecture hall? I hope not. Do you see the local church as an entertainment complex? 
fun and games, a good time? Do you see the local church as a purveyor of religious goods and services? You're all the consumers and we're the providers and we provide a great consumer experience for you. Goods and services of a religious nature. We're the Amazon of church. How do you see the church? That's not how Paul saw the church. See the, Paul, see the church as Paul saw the church. Think about the church as Paul thought about the church, as the family of God, as the church of the living God, as a pillar and buttress of the truth. If you see the church in these terms, if you think of the church in these ways, this will shape your experience in the church. It will. This will shape how we live together in the church. Let's pray and ask the Lord. Lord, make it so, we pray. Change, grow, develop our perspective our theology, the way we see and the way we think about the church. Lift it up, we pray. Give us a higher view of the church. We just confess together that we've thought of it in small terms. We've thought of it in me terms. And you call us to something else. Thanks for your word. Thanks for all that we've got in these pastoral epistles. Thanks for the reminder of uh, what to look for in a church what's important in a local church, what we're striving to be here at Grace Central Coast. We have not arrived yet, but keep growing us, we ask and pray. Keep forming us, godly leadership, gospel-centered teaching, and we pray that we might love one another as a family committed and caring together. In Christ Jesus' name we pray and for his sake, amen.